Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be on this planet. Thank you once again for joining me right here on the York Report. I'm Marty York. Of course, I am absolutely excited and delighted to be joined this evening as advertised by uh, the man who I consider the best NFL analyst who I've ever heard and uh, actually know the man because I've uh, dealt with him before during my days uh, covering football at the Globe and Mail. And folks, I tell you, because I covered football on TSN and on uh, Sportsnet here in Canada, no one tells it like it is more than Joe Theismann. And Joe, thank you so much for joining me tonight. You're welcome, Marty. It's always good to catch up with you. Joe, uh, I'll tell you, uh, first of all, folks, uh, you, I'm going to uh, in, inform you, uh, although you, I'm sure you already know that uh, Joe Theismann was a legendary quarterback, not only in the Canadian Football League, but also in uh, the National Football League. He played 12 seasons with the Washington Redskins, where he was a two-time Pro Bowler and quarterback of the winning team in Super Bowl 17. He was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame for his days at Notre Dame in 2003. And nowadays, of course, you can catch Joe Theismann on the NFL Network as a color analyst on Thursday Night Football. He was great with ESPN. He's been great wherever he's covered football because he tells it like it is. For instance, when he was asked about Ricky Williams coming to uh, the Canadian Football League and playing for his former team, the Toronto Argonauts, Joe simply said he couldn't understand it because of Ricky Williams' background. Everybody knows uh, Ricky Williams had a a drug history, particularly with marijuana, and, and Joe just came right out and expressed his feelings that, you know, why should the CFL be a haven for drug users when Ricky Williams at that time was suspended by the NFL? And uh, more recently, uh, he, he uh, decided to be critical of uh, Alan Pinkett. We talked about that here in the York Report when uh, Pinkett decided to say that a criminal element is needed on, fo on college football teams, and uh, he thought it was a good thing that four members of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish were suspended and uh, uh, Joe uh, took uh, issue with that and came right out and said he, uh, the, that uh, Pinkett's comments were ridiculous. Now, Joe, uh, I know that that issue with uh, Notre Dame is probably still fresh in your mind. Uh, Pinkett was uh, suspended uh, by the network uh, covering the uh, Fighting Irish. Just your thoughts about his suspension. Well, you know, Marty, I don't, uh, you know, we all work for different people. Um, and, you know, your bosses make determinations on what they feel like they need to do based upon your production and what you say and what you do. And, you know, we're in a very socially media conscious society. And um, I took exception to what Alan said because I don't believe the University of Notre Dame, nor do I believe any university, needs to have a criminal element uh, as a part of their athletic programs to be successful. I think you demean the young men and young women that work so hard. There's an awful lot of great kids out there that are tremendous athletes. And to think that you need a criminal element uh, as a part of your athletic program to be successful in any country or at any university, I, I think is, is it's absurd. Well, folks, uh, we're obviously going to pick Joe Theismann's brain about the, uh, the NFL season, which began last night on Wednesday night for the first time in, uh, since 1948. But uh, uh, Joe's going to be, uh, you're going to hear him each and every week on the uh, NFL Network as a color analyst on Thursday night football. Thank goodness you're going to be able to catch him on that because, uh, well, Marty, let me just say this. I, I'm actually not. Mike Mayock is doing that now. Ah. Uh, like, like um, as we talked about, uh, as I just mentioned, you know, um, you're at the uh, bequest of uh, the executives that run organizations, and uh, I'm uh, really no longer with the NFL Network, nor am I doing Thursday night. So that's, oh. I did it, though. The biography was correct as a part of the past. Yeah, I do want to set the record straight so if people tune in looking for me. Wonder if I disappeared? <laughs> so, uh, no, I didn't. I'm not. I'm not doing a vanishing act. So, so we're not going to see you on any NFL broadcast this year? No, nope. no, oh. uh, no one has invited me to participate uh, to talk about the NFL except you, Marty, and I appreciate that, it. That, Joe, that's pissing me off. Frankly, I, I mean, I honestly like the fact that you would tell it like it is, and you know, as a guy who's. Uh, uh, covered the Canadian Football League on the airwaves in this country. Uh, you know, I know that from time to time, uh, executives in the, uh, you know, at, at top make decisions. They won't let you always speak your mind. There are times where they give you hell for saying what's on your mind. You spoke your mind. Did you get, did you catch flack for that? 
No, no, it was just my contract was up, and I think, uh, you know, they wanted to move in a different direction, and they have. So, you know, I mean, I've got I've got a lot of things that keep me busy. I was just in Toronto uh, last night, as yeah. a matter of fact, uh, on, a, on a Tuesday evening at the NFL Canada headquarters. I spent some time there and did a fantasy football um, outing and just had a wonderful time back in, you know, like I told everybody in the audience, it's just great to be back home. Whenever I go to Toronto, and I've been there, Oh, in the last um, two months, I've been there twice. Once we did a, a reunion for the 71 team, which is a documentary that will run during the Grey Cup week, and then for a uh, fantasy football get-together uh, the other evening. So, it, like I say, it's just always great to be back in Toronto. And some things have changed, but fortunately a lot of things haven't. Well, you know, when, when I saw you at the uh, reunion, and, uh, you, you know, I don't know how you do this, Joe, and I'm not trying to suck up to you, I swear to you, I don't know how it is that, I mean, you played in, in the early 70s in the CFL under Leo Cahill. I don't know how the hell you look the way you do. And I've said this so many times. You look like you're still 30. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> you look like you can still play. Now, I, I know that you suffered one of the great, the worst injuries in NFL history. We'll talk about that a little later. But uh, how the hell do you keep looking this way? Are you working out every day or what? I work out about three or four days a week. I try to. I really try and watch my diet and try and get exercise. And I, I guess I'm pretty blessed with some great genes from my mom and dad. So that, I think, has as much to do with it as anything. Well, and, and Joel was born to Austrian Joseph John Theismann, who ran a gas station and worked in his brother's liquor store. His Hungarian mother, Olga Tobias, worked for Johnson & Johnson until her retirement. And, and Joel was raised in South River, New Jersey, Folks, he was born September 9th, 1949. Does not look it. Does not look it. Okay. And now, Joe, I want to go back to 1972 in your Toronto days, as you mentioned. But before I even ask you about the, uh, the Argonauts, um, i, I got to ask you, uh, this is the 40th anniversary month of the 1972 Summit Series. And uh, I, I'm just wondering if at that time you had broken your leg in the opening game of the 72 season. But... It, did you get caught up at all in the emotion of that Canada-Soviet Union series? Did you stay in Toronto during your injury? Uh, no, you know, I, I, I did because I came back and played about six weeks after the injury, almost uh, six, seven weeks. So I did stay there. And I, and I was a matter of fact, uh, as I've been reading the newspapers um, up there, I, I know it was a great series. They've had a great reunion. And, I mean, let's face it, I, I had the good fortune to play professional football in Canada. But if you talk about a country sport, it's hockey. And uh, the, the Canadians and the Russians for years, you know, had incredible competition. And then the U.S. had its, you know, its shot at glory uh, for a period of time. But, I mean, those, those were incredible rivalries uh, when you think about the two countries and the athletes that competed and the way they competed. You know, you don't see, you just don't see that today. Everybody's... Today, people are a bit more technical. Um, you know, your lines change a little bit more. They're a little bit different. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll see hockey if, uh, you know, Gary Bateman and, and, you know, the league owners can, you know, work things out and you wind up with an agreement that allows, you know, the great fans of Canada to be able to enjoy their national sport. And, and even down here, I mean, you you know, you go to Phoenix or or different places where, Hockey has become a very, very enjoyable uh, sport for everybody um, all the way across North America. Well, and uh, I mean, you're right. People in Canada live, breathe, and eat hockey. But uh, my my sports football, <laughs> and, uh, and I and I certainly recall your entire career. And uh, you know, I want to ask you: after you left the uh, the Canadian Football League and the Argos. Uh, in uh, 74, I want to say, right? Uh, yeah, well, actually, after the 73 season, I joined the Redskins in 74, that's correct. Okay, but why do I remember that uh, there was a very brief period, and I can't find it anywhere online or anything like that, but you were with the Dolphins, and you wanted so badly to get into the NFL that here you were, an established quarterback, or I guess a guy who was trying to establish himself in the NFL, and you actually returned punts. Am I right about that? Well, yeah, but I, I never joined the Miami Dolphins. I uh, I opted to go to the Argonauts, so I never actually played for the Dolphins. But well, who did you return punts for? The actually, I did it for the Argonauts. Um, right. Yeah, you know, because of because of the single up there, 
I used to stand in the end zone or, you know, when, when somebody punted into the end zone, it was my job to catch it and kick it out. Yeah, so I we remember that. Because yeah. you were also the backup uh, punter, if I'm not mistaken. I was a lousy one at that. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, Zen and Indrazition didn't give me a chance to kick at all, which was wonderful when <laughs> he was a there. Name. There's a name, the big Z. <laughs> I moved, uh, then when I came down to the Redskins in 1974, I, I worked for eight weeks and all through training camp just catching punts and finally uh midway through the season i snuck on the field um without really george allen knowing that i was going out there but once i got out there i wasn't coming back i caught the ball and all you really ever needed to do was perform for george you couldn't make a mistake or else it was all over and i was lucky enough to be able to return punts for uh the 74 and 75 season Delighted to be on the line with the legendary Joe Theismann. And Joe, you know, George Allen ended up coming to the CFL uh, with the Montreal Alouettes at that time. And uh, I wondered if he ever talked to you about the league before he uh, came to Canada. No, no, George was, uh, George was all about uh, the Rams and, and about the uh, National Football League, so we never really discussed the Canadian League. All right, and I, I mentioned a little earlier, and I just I, I'm, I'm going through your personal career before I start picking your brain about the the, the NFL season that began last night. But uh, I, I, I guess it it was called the hit that no one who saw it can ever forget by the Washington Post. It was, of course, the hit that ended your career, November eighteenth, nineteen eighty five. You suffered a com, com, comminuted, com, I don't even know how you pronounce that word, compound fracture of the leg right. while being sacked by uh, Lawrence Taylor and Harry Carson during a Monday night football game telecast, and I remember seeing it. I remember Howard Cassell, like it was five minutes ago, saying, don't look at this if you're weak-hearted. And uh, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was the ugliest thing I'd ever seen, to be frank, and uh, because I, I happened to to really be a fan of yours, uh, it really, really got to me, and obviously not as much as it got to you. Uh, what are your memories of that particular hit? Well, I, that that whole um, that whole experience for me was really a life changing experience because I uh, I had enjoyed tremendous tremendous success in the National Football League and had reached a what I thought was a pinnacle in my career when really it should have just been a, a step on the ladder of life and, and in my career. And and I just I, I got all highfalutin and thought that I was really a, a a wonderful quarterback and that everything revolved around me and I had become a very very self centered egotistical individual and that incident that accident that evening um, really slammed my feet back on the ground literally and made me take a long hard look at who I was and my relationships and the way I treated people and the way I acted and. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are many people listening out there that have gone through life-changing experiences that just set you back on your heels and you sort of have to reload. And for me, the one single most important thing in my life was football. Uh, it was, it was pri- took priorities over faith, family, and everything else. And so I had my priorities somewhat screwed up, and it, it managed to redirect my life. And hopefully I'm a much better human being today because of that then uh, you know i probably would have been had the incident not occurred well okay i'm not i don't like to suck up to people but uh, honestly joe uh, i remember talking to you during uh, the course of your career when you were flying high when you were winning super bowls and uh, i thought you were always a, a first rate gentleman which is why i remember you and i don't say this about a lot of athletes which is why i'm not uh, very well liked by many of them but uh, the truth is that uh, I can remember coming up to you at a hockey game one time. You're watching the Maple Leafs, and uh, you had all the time in the world. Uh, you were always, uh, to me, a, a perfect gentleman, and honest to God, that's I'll leave it at that, and uh, you don't even have to comment on that. In 1985, folks, Joe Theismann helped call Super Bowl, the Super Bowl for ABC along Frank Gifford and Don Meredith, becoming only the second person to do commentary on a Super Bowl telecast while still an active player at the time. The first was Jack Kemp, by the way, when he helped call Super Bowl II for CBS. Uh, Joe served as color commentator on regional CBS NFL coverage in 86 and 87, then worked on ESPN Sunday Night Football telecasts uh, with Paul McGuire, I remember, from 1988 to 2005, and on their Monday Night Football coverage in 2006. Uh, he's done it all. I wish he was uh, actually... Uh, broadcasting the Canadian Football League, but they couldn't pay him enough. In any case, I want to talk to you, Joe, about, I want to pick your brain as 
I, I thought you were on the NFL Network, and I was absolutely stunned to hear that you're not. But in any case, uh, I want to talk to you about the coming NFL season. I know you, you follow it closely. I'd like to just take a quick break, Joe, and then come right back to you and talk about some of the things that are going on in the NFL right now. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, great. Folks, stay tuned. The legendary Joe Theismann when we come back. Great Canadian Adventure Contest. Brought to you by Kahuna Power Sports and Cheetah Power Surge. Simply submit a video sharing your great Canadian dream adventure across Canada, and you could win one of four fantastic Kawasaki prizes from Kahuna Power Sports. You could win an ATV, motorcycles, or the grand prize, Kawasaki 2012 Versus 1000. Enter today at cheetahpowersurge.com and energize yourself with Cheetah Power Surge, now with new green apple flavor. And welcome back to the York Report. I'm Marty York. And folks, I am absolutely thrilled tonight to be joined on the line by Joe Theismann, the former NFL and CFL quarterback, the former NFL analyst, and I think the best one that's, that's ever been. And I don't say that about too many people, but he, to me, was the, was the one guy you could count on to tell it like it is, like if somebody was playing poorly, he would say so. And uh, I don't know uh, why he's not on the NFL Network, but I think that's an error. In any case, uh, Joe Theismann is, I'm delighted that he's here with us tonight, and I want to talk to him a little bit about the uh, coming NFL season. Well, actually, it started last night, and the Giants, I didn't think, looked very good at all. Their offensive line uh, looked uh, kind of weak. Uh, their defensive secondary, I know it was a little banged up, but I thought Tony Romo had all kinds of fun with that secondary. I just wanted to get your thoughts on the Super Bowl defending champions, Joe. Well, you know, Marty, I think the thing you have to realize is the Giants had a great run at the end of the season, but at one point they were 7-7. Seven and seven. They finished the season 9-7 and seven and went on and won four straight games in the playoffs to win the world championship. And th they weren't that dominant a football team. Right. Yes, they won the world championship. You go know, back the year before, the Green Bay Packers were 15-1 and one this past season, but they were 9-7 and seven when they won the world championship. They basically barely got by Chicago to get in, just like the Giants barely got by San Francisco to get in this past year. I, I thought the Dallas Cowboys a year ago were the best team in the division. They just figured out ways to lose games in the fourth quarter. Um, I think they're a better football team. DeMarco Murray looks like he gives them a running game, which is sorely needed. Yeah, and and Tony is, you know, Tony can make plays. Des Bryant is is a beast, um, and they've got some receivers. I mean, their defense is pretty good. I, it's a it's a very solid football team. But I agree with you. Watching the Giants last night, they dropped a lot of balls. Um, they they didn't play the ball very well in the air. Tony made some plays, and you sort of knew it was going to be that kind of a game. Most of the games in the NFC East are single score games anyway. Right, and uh, I, I mean, we, we've got a few of those matchups uh, on the weekend, but before I even uh, ask you about them, I wanted to ask you specifically about Peyton Manning. Coming back uh, uh, to, in, to the NFL after missing last season in Indianapolis, he's with the Denver Broncos now. And uh, there are some people out there, Joe, who think that the addition of Manning makes the Broncos an immediate Super Bowl contender. Are you of uh, that uh, frame of mind? No, I think they. I think they. I think Peyton has some things to prove to himself, as well as uh, you know his teammates. Can you know? Can he? Can he play basically every game outside in November and December? I mean, I know what happened to my arm when I was 30, uh, 35 years old. I went from thirty four to thirty five, or thirty three to thirty five. In Peyton's case, he played when he was thirty four. Now he's going to be thirty six. Um, it physically wears on you. I mean, he's thrown a lot of passes, and he's played a lot. I just want to see him get through the season healthy. That, that, that is the goal for me, for Peyton Manning. I, I think if they don't go 11-5 and five and win the division or thereabouts, it's going to be, have to be considered a failure because the window is so short with Peyton. Such a short window. Yeah. And so you have to say to yourself, it's now or never for him. I got to ask you about this little story here, Joe. Uh, the Den There's a school in in Colorado. I don't know if you heard about this yet. Uh, Denver Broncos tight end Joel Dreesen says he isn't bothered by the Greeley School 
district's ban on his jersey number and others because they're associated with local gangs. The district bans 13, 14, and 18, and they're reversed, 31, 41, and 81. Dreesen wears 81. The rule is three years old but made headlines this week after a third grader wearing Peyton Manning's number 18 was sent home to change. Dreesen said Thursday the ban doesn't bother him if it prevents trouble. 18 is the name of the 18th street gang, while 13 and 14 are associated with other gangs but not used in their names. Uh, Joe, is that a bit of a stretcher? I mean, like Peyton Manning fans can't wear the number eighteen. You know, can't wear his jersey. Well, we see, you know, we've seen a lot of very different things happen in school programs around the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, you you have to be sensitive with Columbine being in Colorado. I think you have to be sensitive to uh, the officials that run school programs. And and it isn't. Certainly it isn't anything that has to do with the National Football League. If they feel that um, some type of dress might put a, a young man or a young woman in harm's way, you know, I think it's the responsibility of the people in a school to be able to delegate what that person you know, should possibly wear or not wear based upon what they think may be harmful to them. I, you know, an ounce of caution uh, I, that goes a long way. I mean, I've seen some things that have been absurd as far as schools go, and, you know, they wind up recanting what they've done. But in this case, you know, I think for Joel Dreesen, it's, you know, to be honest with you, as a football player, it's nice for the kids to wear it, and that's fine. But, you know, you're you're out to win football games and out to be a good person, and if somebody wears your jersey, that's just sort of a benefit. And if, like I say, the officials in the school feel that it may be a problem, and and they handle it the way they feel like they have to. On the line with the great Joe Theismann. And, Joe, I want to ask you about the Minnesota Vikings and specifically the fact that Adrian Peterson will indeed be in the lineup when the, uh, when the Vikings play their season opener on Sunday. Uh, he, as you know, of course, is recovering from a surgically repaired left knee. Uh, how much better are the Vikings with Peterson in the lineup? Or, and do you have any concerns about his knee situation? Well, I've, I've always been a firm believer that knees are two week, uh, two-year injuries. Wow. Uh, you come back and, and you play, but you're never really quite yourself until the second year. Uh, the most important thing for Adrian, and he may, you know, he's a freak of nature anyway physically, so he may just wind up rushing for 1,800 yards. I mean, you, you really don't know. Yeah. But uh, I, I've always felt like the knee is, is one of those injuries that just the confidence takes a little while to get back, the strength takes a little while to get back. Uh, he hasn't really been exposed to any contact, any hard cutting, other than in practice, and games are different. Uh, again, he's one of those great athletes that plays in the National Football League that you just want to make sure that he gets through it in one piece. And I, I, as the year goes on, if he stays healthy, you'll start to see him get better and better and better. And I don't know if he'll be the same violent runner that we've seen in the past, uh, but that's going to have to come back to him for be, to be effective. But I, I think he'll be fine. Certainly Christian Ponder needs him, their quarterback. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, that he's got uh, – yeah, although I've talked to some NFL experts who think he's going to be uh, okay this season, uh, obviously it's going to depend a lot on the, on the offensive line there. He's okay, Marty. They've had a great year. Uh, yeah. He's just exceptional. That's the thing that you look at. When you have somebody like an Adrian Peterson or a Peyton Manning and a Tom Brady a Drew Brees uh, – they hold themselves to a different standard even than the fans or you or I would hold them to. And, and having been there, I know what it feels like. Uh, in Adrian's case, I'm sure you know he knows what he needs to do to be the Adrian Peterson that we've come to know before the injury. So I think a little bit of a question in his mind exactly what it's going to look and feel like when he starts. Uh, we have a young man down here uh, by the name of uh, Roy Hillou with the Washington Redskins. He had um, tendonitis in both Achilles' heels. And in the last preseason game when he played, he was very tentative in the first two or three carries. And then as he got lathered up, you could see more and more confidence come back. And that's pretty much what I expect from Adrian. Joe, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you your thoughts about uh, Bounty Gate, about uh, New Orleans, uh, the whole uh, controversy there. Do you think the Saints are going to come back and, and be just fine without their coach, uh, Sean Payton. I don't think the Saints will be that affected by it. I think Sean Payton has created an environment there that is very strong. 
uh, when Sean got hurt and, and couldn't participate in play calling a year ago, it was against the Indianapolis Colts, and the, the, the Saints put up 55 right. with uh, Pete Carmichael calling it uh, calling play. So they have, you know, they have a very strong staff, and they've certainly weathered it, but they have a quarterback that can handle anything. I mean, Drew Brees is is the stick that stirs that pot. Trust me. Uh, if something was to happen to him, it might be a whole different story. But as long as Drew is pulling the trigger and he's got you know Jimmy Graham and he's got Darren Sproles to throw the football to, and you're probably going to have a very upset defensive group of guys. Every talk about a team playing with a chip on their shoulder. Theirs is more like a boulder. So you you're anticipating a very good season from the Saints. I'm anticipating a a, a, a tough season. I think it's. You know, I think I think they're equipped to be able to do very well. But like anything else, it's gonna if you don't throw interceptions, you don't make mistakes. You're gonna win football games. Joe, uh, the season has begun without the regular officials in place, and uh, of course they're holding out. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, the the they're waiting for uh, more money. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the NFL is using are u- is using uh, replacement officials and. Uh, I've, you know, I, I just from talking to NFL people, they're 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 worried, they're concerned that there are going to be, uh, you know, some huge errors are going to have significant effects on the games. Uh, I I'd like to know your thoughts on uh, the replacement officials and what we're what we're going to see. Well, I think you saw it last night. I mean, I felt like the Giants in their first opportunity to score, there was no question the receiver was mugged, held and mugged. Yeah, and there was no flag. Um, you have officials that aren't used to looking at the game at a professional level. They're looking at a college game. And, and you, I mean, it's one thing to have a clinic. It's like, Marty, let's you and I, you and I go read a book on tennis, okay? Right. And then let's go play Roger Federer. Yeah. And let's see how well we do. <laughs> and then well, basically what you're asking these officials to do, uh, to a large degree, is go to clinics, go to classes, without the experience of the speed of the game. I mean, they're, they're going to make mistakes. And I'll grant that other officials made mistakes as well. And the other thing is, too, is upstairs in the, in the replay booth, they are not replacement officials. They're league-hired officials that are the replay guys. Right. Every turnover is looked at the re, up, upstairs in replay. Every touchdown is looked at in replay. So they've taken a little bit of the burden off of the officials on the field. I still think the game is a much better game when the full-time officials do their job. And I don't believe that these men need to be full-time jobs. I, right. I really don't. Right. I don't I don't see that as a as a a requirement at all. And I would I mean, I think they've done a terrific job under the circumstances that they've worked under before. Now you start kicking everything upstairs, I think they'll even be better. But this game needs professional people working it. And uh, you, you hate to see a game lost because someone doesn't understand a rule or someone is not officiating the game the way it should be officiated at the professional level. It's, I'll give you a classic. The NBA. Yep. Does anybody ever walk in the NBA? Uh, you see it all the time. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying, but it's ever called. No, no. That's my point. There are <laughs> things that happen in professional sports yeah. that don't happen at, at other levels. Well, I'll tell you another thing that happens. I don't know if you had a chance to see this uh, when you were up in Canada uh, at, at the CFL game or not, uh, but uh, and now maybe you could be you're watching some of the CFL games on on uh, NBC. But <laughs> I, I swear to you, Joe, almost every play when the receivers go into motion, they do go offside before the ball snapped. Oh yeah, the receivers are already on the other side of the line. Green of football is the same way in the United States. When you have multiple people moving towards the line of scrimmage, how do you know that they're behind the line of scrimmage when it's snapped? So you have that, you have that cushion area. Yeah. That they, they sort of, uh, you know, officials say, okay, you know, it's part of the game. The guy's moving and, and they let it go. But it's sort of an unwritten rule. And there, I think one of the hardest things for officials in this particular year is because of Bounty Gate, because of the, the hard hits. I mean, I, I see. You know, unsportsmanlike conduct called penalties called because a uh, a guy turns around and, and comes back and blocks somebody legally. Yeah, they block him. But you know, and I watched a college I watched a college game last year where the official came on and said it's a 15 yard penalty because the one guy hit the other guy too hard. Right. And that's the one fear I have, Marty, about where this game could go 
is the integrity of the game is one of violence and contact. And you want to try and, you know, curb the violence. But how do you, how do you protect against the contact? How do you tell guys? You, you tell a guy going after somebody, go half speed, they're the ones that are going to get hurt. Yeah, It's the nature of the game. So I'm still curious to see how it plays out. This, this weekend will be a fun weekend to watch because there will be a lot of replacement guys on the field. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it's going to be uh, – look, I hope those NFL – the regular officials come back as quickly as possible, except maybe for Ed Hockley, who <laughs> I could take or leave him, frankly. I don't like his long speeches after every call he makes, but that, that's, that's neither here nor there. I do want to see I, – I, I agree with you. If we see games decided by officiating mistakes, uh, it's going to be hard – to watch the NFL, and it's going to really damage the NFL's integrity. I, do, I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, Joe Theismann, of course, a great legendary quarterback and a great, great NFL analyst. And uh, how well did you know Art Modell? Yeah, Art, I, 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 you know, we lost a great band. It was, you know, Monday Night Football is is here because of Art Modell and what he did with Pete Rozelle to, uh, to get the, the Monday Night Football going. I mean, there are a lot of things that Art Modell did. He's never given any credit for because obviously, when you move, you know, when you move a team, right, you're not going to necessarily get anybody to feel good about you, right. But uh, the bottom line is, is he did an awful lot for professional football. It's a game that it's a gentleman that um, you know I think certainly deserves a lot of credit for where the game is today. And you know, we lost a, a great part of our heritage when Art passed away last night. And uh, Art Modell died at the age of 87, early Thursday. And I remember the days when he was being uh, glorified and deified as the Cleveland Browns owner during the Jimmy Brown days, I guess. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, his reputation was tainted when he moved his franchise from Cleveland to Baltimore. But uh, as you say, Joe, he did a heck of a lot for the NFL. And uh, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the Monday Night Football thing until you just mentioned that. But uh, I mean, that's just one of the things he did. I know there was a lot more, and uh, I'm not so sure there would have even been uh, a merger if it wasn't for, if he didn't play a role in that. Quite possibly. Yeah. Quite possibly. Okay, folks, on the line with Joe Se- Theismann, I'm not going to take uh, his entire evening, but uh, certainly appreciate him being here, and I'm just going to go through a few more questions, uh, Joe, if that's okay. Uh, I need to know your Super Bowl picks. I, otherwise, I'd ask you about every team individually, but... Who do you like to end up in the Super Bowl this year? Well, I, I, you know, I thought I thought both the San Francisco 49ers and the Baltimore Ravens had great opportunities to be there last year. Um, a drop pass, a missed kick, probably cost Baltimore a chance. A fumbled ball cost San Francisco a chance. And I, I think those two teams will be back. And so I think it'll be the brother battle down in New Orleans. It'll be Jim Harbaugh and John Harbaugh going at it in, uh, in the Super Bowl. That would be kind of cool. And uh, what about your Grey Cup picks? You know, Mark Tresman has always been a close friend of mine, and he's the coach of the Montreal Alouettes. So in my heart, I think, you know, with Anthony Calvito up there and what he's been able to do in his career is phenomenal. But I sure like what Ricky Ray and, and Coach is doing up there with the Argonauts. So, you know, out west, um, you know, Winnipeg has to figure out if they can score, forget about winning a game. Right. And, um, you know... <laughs> I wouldn't pick Calgary only because I don't like them because they beat us. So I didn't care. I wouldn't care if they were undefeated. It wouldn't matter to me. You know, you know I, I got to interrupt you for one second, Joe. I've got to tell you something. I spoke to Leon McQuay uh, before he obviously, uh, well, he was in the USFL, I think it was at this time, and he was just helping Johnny Bassett uh, as a custodian kind of thing in the clubhouse. But uh, talk to him about that play the, the famous fumble in and and at in the super bowl against calgary uh, in the great cup i should say against calgary and he said that if that fumble occurred later on it would not have been counted as a fumble because it was caused by the ground yeah i think i think everybody looks at it that way but the, the weather was so bad I, I really felt like the stampeders caught a lucky break uh, against us because we were a very fast scoring football team and we had a lot of speed. It was negated to a large degree by the weather conditions and just weren't able to throw. And I actually watched the Great Cup uh, when we were up there in 71. I didn't realize it ran for my life quite as much as I did. <laughs> Calgary was a great football team, and it was, it was an honor to be able to represent the eastern part of, the, uh, of Canada. 
um, in the Grey Cup and be able to play in that game. But we have a lot of very fond memories of it, Marty. It was a, it was a great experience. I'm not sure who's going to come out. I mean, there are a lot of teams that have won six games. Now you start the second half of the season. You know, now the money time of the year starts in the Canadian Football League. Mm-hmm. I, I sure like, you know, the Toronto win down in Hamilton just over Labor Day weekend. I think was a huge, I think it was a huge confidence builder for them. And you know, Harry Burris, that's a heck of a, Henry. Henry is a heck of a quarterback. And you know, Hamilton's, you know. Got to figure out what they're doing. That's going to be a big game this weekend for the Argos. Hey, I like it. The man still knows his CFL, folks. Joe Theismann. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you remember this, Joe, but I saw you. I saw you one day. I think it was in an NFL training camp. If I'm not mistaken, I was there doing a feature on Mark Rippon, and you were you happened to be there uh, in, at the Washington camp, and. Uh, I asked you, uh, yeah, I asked you uh, about uh, at that time with the purchase of the Argos uh, by uh, Bruce McNall, Wayne Gretzky, and the late John Candy, and you said to me at that time that you would be interested in purchasing a little piece of the Argos. Uh, it never happened, uh, of course, but uh, would you still have that interest? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, you never know. I mean, it's uh, you'd have to look at the economics of it, and certainly the team is starting to play a lot better football, and and that's what really gets people out. I mean, people will come out. If you win, people come. If you lose, they don't. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a very complicated formula in sports. Uh, they want to be entertained, but they also want to be able to go and cheer for somebody. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great to see the Argos doing well again. And, I, I, you know, I, Coach Milinovic, is, he's got them in the right direction. He really does. Yeah, and the Grey Cup's in Toronto this year. Are you going to make it for that? I, I, well, that, you know, that's the same weekend as our American Thanksgiving. So right. uh, my wife... I've worked in, in the booth for so many years, Marty. My wife said, "Finally, we get a Thanksgiving at home, so I can't say, hey, Rob, look, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to Canada for the Grey Cup on a, a Thanksgiving.' So I haven't been. The Hall Pass hasn't been canceled yet, but it's not being offered either. So <laughs> I hope to make it up there for some of the events during the course of the week, though. Well, Joe, it's always great to have you up in Canada. Believe me, and for those of up, us who uh, who grew up watching you in Canada in the '70s and then uh, watching. You play uh, for the Washington Redskins for all those years. Uh, I mean, it was a great treat. Uh, you're one of the top guys I've known in the game, and I'm not saying that. Folks, you know I don't suck up to people, but this is Joe Theismann, okay? <laughs> and, and Joe Theismann, thank you so, so much for joining us here on the York Report tonight. Thanks, Marty. Great catching up with you. All right, Joe Theismann, folks.